Hi, welcome to Exploring Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today's episode is titled Tarl Warwick Explains Why God's Omniscience Refutes Free Will. Okay, um, this is episode 78. Um, Tarl, it's with a T, not a C, is a student, a college student who goes to school in Vermont. And I found what I'm going to present today. It's like a 12 minute clip um, on YouTube. And the title of it on YouTube is An All Knowing God Versus Free Will, The Greatest Religious Contradiction. And if you want to look up Tarl's um, work on YouTube, he's got like a lot of things up there. His channel is, I don't know if I can um, pronounce this correctly, Sticks and, <laughs> Sticks and Hammer 666 or something like that. I don't know. I'm going to put it on the description uh, when I upload this to the internet. Okay, so um, let's look at the video and then I'll come back to make comments on it. Okay, thanks. All right, YouTube, I thought I'd cover a couple of major logical contradictions dealing with the Christian God. Now, this can also be applied to most theistic groups. Most theistic groups branching off of Judaism, of course, the Mormons, the Islamics, Christians, and so forth, they have different dogmatic beliefs and ritualistic beliefs, but they essentially believe the same ideas about the one Abrahamic God which they follow. But there are logical contradictions to the characteristics ascribed to those gods. Now, before I've disproven that such a god can possibly exist, now I'm just going to go into some logical contradictions, uh, which any significantly advanced fourth grader should be able to understand. The first being the concept of free will versus omniscience. That is, the Christians claim their God knows everything, past, present, and future, because their God is all-encompassing and all-powerful, therefore knows literally everything, because otherwise the God would be limited and wouldn't be all-powerful. If it doesn't know everything, not all-powerful. Let's take an example, and you can boil it down to mathematics when you really think about it, and I debated a fundamentalist 30 minutes last night talking about this topic. Look at it this way. Let's say that you have a choice between an apple and an orange. You can choose one of the two. This is simplifying it somewhat, but it's a real-life situation. You've got an apple and an orange on the table in front of you. You can pick one. Let's assume, let's posit the existence of an all-knowing creator who knows absolutely everything before it happens. Thus, this creator figure would know whether you are going to pick the apple or the orange. Let's say the creator knows you're going to pick the apple. Are you physically capable of picking the orange? That's the question. If you are not physically capable of picking the orange, yes, God can be all-knowing. However, it proves that you do not have free will, because the existence of free will is something that Christians also believe in. They believe in an omniscient God, they also believe in free will, free will, because in order for you to be adequately judged worthy of heaven or hell, you have to be able to make a logical, rational choice about whether you want to worship their god or not. If there's no free will, then the god is a tyrant, because the god already knows you're going to heaven or hell and simply puts you there for actions he or it knew you would already undertake. So in this problem, this logical contradiction shows itself. Either you cannot have free will, or God cannot be omniscient, or the God doesn't exist. Let's assume that their God exists. If you have the ability, if you have the choice between the apple or the orange, and God knows you're going to choose the apple, but you pick the orange, you've just negated God's omniscience. If you are unable to pick the orange, then you have negated free will. That is to say, they cannot simultaneously coexist. If things are known, and this goes to mathematics, if you have a known value, it can't also be a variable. You can pretend x is a variable, and you already know what x is, but it's already a known value. It can't, if x equals 3, it can't also equal 4. It's a logical contradiction. It contradicts mathematics. It contradicts common sense. So the ultimate disproof of the nature not the existence, but the dogmatic, scriptural nature of the Christian version of God, which the majority of Christians believe in, is that free will cannot coexist with omniscience. It's not physically possible. 
they will preempt this by saying, oh, well, you still have the choice to choose the apple or an orange. It's just God who knows it, but you don't know it, so there's free will. No, that is the illusion of free will. You are still unable to pick the orange if God already knows you're going to pick the apple. If God knows all of your actions beforehand, everything that you do is absolutely predestined. Free will is an illusion, and therefore you can take that a logical step further. Either there is no hell or heaven, and God's not judging anyone, in which case God can be a kind, reasonable God with free, with free will not existing, in which case God's not a tyrant. Or God is absolutely malevolent and evil for putting people in hell to suffer forever, according to most Christians this is the case, for simply not believing in God when he already knew they wouldn't believe in God in the first place. In fact, it means that God, to send anyone to hell, has to violate his own scriptural commandments and be malevolent and wrathful for things which people cannot physically help because there is no such thing as free will. So the ultimate logical proof that the Christian God cannot exist in the form described by the Bible. I'm not saying cannot exist. I've already shown logical reasons why God virtually, surely doesn't exist. But let's assume that God does. The reason we know God doesn't exist as the Christians claim God to exist is that they believe in both free will, that is the choice to choose heaven or hell, and the omniscience of this creator figure, they cannot coexist. It's a logical contradiction which cannot be reconciled. There is no mathematical, logical, reasonable, realistic way to reconcile the two statuses there. It's just not possible. I would point out a million other contradictions. You can look at the Christian religion. You can point out contradictions on the logic of existent God, that is, the belief that a God actually exists, the nature of that God, the validity historically or logically of scripture, the behavior of Christians. There are many different subsets you can go into and question the validity of the Christian religion as it's practiced or as it's taught or as its precepts on a logical basis based on the idea of their God and their God's nature. There are many different angles of attack. I think the most important one is that free will and omniscience are unable to coexist. Like I said, if you have the choice, then God doesn't know beforehand because you have the choice to pick whichever one you want, and or God simply lacks the power to know, or free will is an illusion, God sends people to hell for things that he knew that they would do in the first place. and. Fundamentalist, predominantly when this is pointed out, and I've had this experience before, when you point out that die-hard logical contradiction that absolutely disproves the nature of their God and of existence as being free, and point out that only one can be true, that either there is free will or God is all-knowing, they will whine to you, and they will pr primarily say, well, that doesn't make sense because, and then they give some vague explanation, which doesn't in itself make rational sense. They'll point, generally what will happen, is they'll point to biblical scripture, and they'll say, well, here it says we have free will to choose heaven or hell. Here it says God is all-powerful and all-knowing. So we know it's true because it's in the Bible. Well, then you have the second and the most famous logical contradiction in Christianity, that is, God is real, the Bible says so. The Bible is true, God says so in the Bible. It's circular reasoning. That's the most famous contradiction. But I would point out to all the atheists and agnostics out there, use the example that I just used in your next debate with the Christian. See if there's any logical way they can reconcile that free will and omniscience coexisting. Let's see if that is physically possible for them to do. I guarantee you it will stump every one of them. They will either devolve into pointing out scriptural ideals, that is to say, God is all-knowing and free will exists, which doesn't make sense for the reason I just mentioned, or they'll resort to insults. Now, if you're on a public chat room and you stump a Christian and they start insulting you, you've basically won the debate. All the other people will normally, unless they're all fundamentalists themselves, they'll understand. These people don't react well to common logic. They don't react well when it's pointed out that the characteristics of the being which they worship 
can't actually exist the way that they claim. This works on Muslims too, because the Muslims also, they claim there is free will. You may choose Allah, you may ignore Allah's commandments and be a heretic. It is also true, according to Islam, that their God, Allah, is all-knowing and is all-powerful. It works the same way for both religious movements. It also works for other religious movements as well. The Mormons would claim the same thing. Nobody is being compelled because the idea is that in order for the idea of salvation, either through a, a God or a dogmatic commandment or through you know a savior figure like Jesus, whichever one's the case, it makes no difference. The idea of salvation through actions or through adherence to a specific ideal or to a savior is based upon the idea that human beings are capable of choosing either that salvation factor or ignoring it completely and thus they doom themselves. They make a conscious decision to ignore God and they themselves choose to go to hell or Hades or Sheol or wherever you want to call it. They make a conscious decision under their own free will of their own free accord to suffer for eternity. That in itself doesn't make a lot of logical sense. It's sort of like God saying, I love you, holds a gun to your head and says, do what I say or else you'll suffer forever. It's sort of like an abusive spouse scenario. But forgetting that for a moment, free will is the basis for Christianity, for Islam, for Mormonism, for the Jehovah's Witnesses, for all these groups, that you choose salvation or you choose damnation. But as I just pointed out, it's relatively easy to denote the fact that that can't actually coexist with a being that already knows what will happen in the future. So the Christians and Muslims and so forth are forced into a situation where they've got several options. They can admit that God's not all-knowing, or that it doesn't exist. They can admit free will is an illusion, or they can just sit there spewing insults at you and not admit that they're wrong. The third choice there is what is most often chosen. I've had this misfortune hundreds and hundreds of times in debates with Christians, and I really should have made this video sooner, um, but I was, I don't know, I was just waiting on the topic. Use that in your next debate against a Christian. Spread it all across the world and see if Christians are capable of reconciling that scenario to the existence of their God and the characteristics of that God which they believe in. It is not physically possible. Peace out. All right, as you've seen, Tarl starts out explaining that the major religions, um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, although not Buddhism really, and to a certain extent Hinduism, have certain attributes that they um, attribute to God. Um, one of them is that God is all-knowing, that God knows the past, the present, and the future. And um, because if God didn't know all of this, he would be limited, okay? He would be limited in, in his being. And again, one of the fundamental attributes of God within these religions is that God is all-powerful, okay? So, so Tarl explains that. Then, um, then as you saw, he, um, he describes a choice. Let's say you're given a choice between an apple and an orange, okay? And let's say God knew, you know, what went from like before the planet was created, before the universe was created, you know, I guess presumably when he created the world because God would know everything. God knew at the moment you had that choice that you would have to pick the apple, okay? If God knows that, then obviously you can't pick the orange. If God knows what you're going to do in advance, because if you did, you would be making um, God, you would be making God wrong. <laughs> That's the thing. Okay, so he points this out. Okay, now Tarl then, he points, he uh, connects this, you know, quite, um, quite importantly to the concept of heaven and hell, because like, you know, in, in these religions, Judaism to a lesser extent, but Christianity and Islam, uh, more so, you've got this great threat of hell. I mean, if you don't believe, for example, that Jesus is like, you know, the Son of God, or, you know, if you don't believe certain things, then, you know, the threat is that you're destined because of this to suffer eternally in hell. Okay, so now the thing is, like, if God, either God is, or, is not omniscient, as, as Tarl explains, or we cannot have a free will, or God doesn't exist. So that means that, like, you know, 
if God isn't omniscient, that means we could choose the apple if we wanted to, um, or the orange if we wanted to, even though God knows. But like, again, you can't have an omniscient God with us, us being able to choose as we want. Um, the last prospect, he's done videos on this God doesn't exist now. My personal definition of God is like I equate God with the universe. In other words, like two other attributes of God that are pretty universal is that are that um, God is, um, let's say, omnipresent or everywhere. And like naturally the universe would be everywhere. God is om omnipotent or powerful. And when you consider, for example, the laws of nature, okay, if they have to, if they apply everywhere, and if they apply at all, they have to have an agent. So I, I would simply describe God as the process of, of the, the laws of nature. So um, I think there, there are ways to, I guess, disprove God from certain theological standpoints. But anyway, assuming God exists, um, you know, he just points out, if you pick the orange, you're negating God's power. You're negating God's omniscience. You can't have God being both omniscient and you're being able to pick what you want. Because, you know, if, if he knows you're going to pick the apple, you can't pick the orange. That's why you don't have free will. Okay. And again, this is like, this is all from a theological perspective. Okay. Then Tarl goes on to explain it mathematically. Um, if you have a known variable, you know, if if you're picking the apple is a known var variable, you can't have a variable in math or in logic or in common sense be both known and unknown, okay? If you know that you're going to pick, if it's known that you're going to pick an apple, you absolutely cannot pick the orange, okay? Um, so then, you know, he explains, I think like many of us um, say, well, wait a minute, well, you know, we are choosing, you know, it, we're making a choice. But as, he, as he's sharp to point out, that is the illusion. That's the illusion of free will. It's not a choice. It's basically um, as a result of, well, in this case, God's omniscience, God's, you know, powerfulness. But let me, let me get a, move away from the theological explanation for, for a bit, just to explain this in more rational scientific terms. Everything in the universe has a cause, okay? This is known. There's nothing that doesn't have a cause. In other words, things don't just happen. There are causes why things happen. Okay, so what happens is, let's say you have a thought. Your thought is going to have a cause. It has to have a cause. And that cause has to have a cause. And the cause of that cause has a cause. And these causes are going back moment by moment in time. In other words, a cause can never follow the effect. It has to always be before the effect. So what you have is a chain of cause and effect going back moment by moment by moment in time. And it goes back before we were born, before the planet was created, before the Big Bang. And that's why this chain of causality leading from the Big Bang, as far as we know, to today is what causes everything. That's why we don't have free will. Now, some physicists, some people will claim, well, wait a minute, you know, like there are certain quantum mechanical phenomena that, that suggest that some things are not caused, that some things are random. But that provides an even stronger refutation of free will because if things are happening randomly, if our thoughts are happening just for no reason at all, they're not caused, then certainly they're not caused by our free will. Okay, so back to um, Tarl's explanation. Um, okay, so and then he, he goes into like a hev heaven and hell dichotomy. Either there is a heaven and hell or God is... Um, or, or we don't have free will. Like, in other words, like, if there's a heaven and hell, that God would be unjust. You know, one of the attributes of God is that he's omnibenevolent. He's all good or he's just. Okay, so like, if there is a heaven and hell, if some people actually go to hell for things that they're not in control of in any way, then God would be unjust. You know, it's, it's a clear, you know, very strong contradiction. Okay, um, what else? <clears throat> okay, incidentally, um, some, you know, Tarl is on the internet, he, he argues with, with theists, you know, about various issues. And uh, many theists will point out, you know, saying, well, you know, the Bible says this. It's, you know, we believe this because it's right here in the Bible. Well, firstly, regarding the, the issue of free will, there is no mention of free will in the Bible. The, the, um, the term was coined in 580 AD by St. Augustine. And he was like, he was actually arguing 
what's known as from, from desire. In other words, he was starting with the premise, well, if God is all good, then um, anything that happens that is wrong cannot be up to God. It has to be up to man. Now, I was just thinking about this recently. I mean, he could have, Augustine could have blamed Satan. I mean, there's this like being Satan, this evil presence that, you know, is supposed to be like the origin of evil. And like, I think Augustine could have just, just as rationally blamed Satan for, for this. But, but he blames man. He says, if God is all good, then it has to be our fault. Again, it's an argument starting with a premise. You know, it's an argument from desire, then moving to, to evidence when, um, when actually, it's, it's actually what's in the Bible. It's in um, Romans. It's Paul talking with, um, speaking to the Romans, his letter to the Romans. He clearly articulates, you know, I want to do what's good. I always want to do what's good, but there are certain times when I can't. And he's basically, through that description, through those statements, explaining that, no, he does not have a free will. If he had a free will, any time he wanted to do good, he'd be able to. Okay. So, um, then Tar goes into, like, I guess, like, um, I guess he goes into, like, just the idea of circular reasoning. In other words, like, a lot of theists who, who are either defending free will or God, they'll say, well, you know, the Bible says that God is real or that we don't have free will. And then, um, <clears throat> then what, you know, you can simply ask, well, you know, all right, well, who is the Bible written by? And the Bible is written by men. It's not written by God, you know. And like, then, you, I mean, there, there are various arguments that actually Tarl doesn't use in this, but like one of them is, for example, is that, um, you know, Satan, you know, this biblical figure that is supposed to deceive us. He's very good at it. You know, he was able to like deceive Adam and Eve into um, eating the, of the fruit of the tree of, um, of, the, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know. And so basically, in other words, like either, you know, for the Bible to be completely, literally, accurately true, that means that every writer in the Bible would have to have ha been completely immune from Satan's influence. In other words, that somehow they would have, like, been able to just, like, not get anything wrong. And then, you know, that begs the question, or that, you know, asks the question, well, if that's the case, why weren't they able to, like, you know, continue that, in, you know, up through today? Okay, um, let's see. Okay, then Tal goes on to, um, yeah, like in terms of our free will, you know, with this health thing, why would anyone of their free will choose to go to hell? Because that's what, that's what like, the art, you know, when people are, are faced with, let's say a person believes certain theological um, teachings, principles, that, you know, do a certain thing. If you don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Son of God, you're going to go to hell. Okay, why would anybody then choose of their own free will to not believe that if they believed that um, they were going to hell? Obviously, they either don't believe that or there's another reason. It's, it's, it's not a freely willed kind of consideration because nobody in their right mind would want to like choose a belief that's going to send them to eternal suffering and nobody chooses to not be in their right mind. So, okay, now I've got to point this out, you know, Tall is kind of like basically attacking the kind of Christian theology that demonizes really people and ideas and groups of people that hold beliefs that are contrary to, to theirs. You know, that's, that's the problem with Christianity, with Judaism, with Islam to a great extent. It, it separates people. It, it pits us against each other simply on, on, the, on the fact that we have, you know, have different beliefs. So, but the, the, the key point here is like it's important to remember that um, – they don't have a free will either, okay? The, the writers of the Bible, the interpreters of the Bible, the modern-day preachers, clerics, whatever, they are doing what they are absolutely compelled to do. So we may, in, in good conscience and through, you know, hard science and logic and evidence, refute their outdated, mistaken notions. You know, like, for example, they would posit that the world is only 6,000 years old, and we know we've been around for, like, 14 billion years, at least, you know, from the Big Bang. You know, they would posit that the first woman came from the, the rib of the first man, and we know that it's, you know, that, you know that's just a myth. So basically, they, they have certain beliefs, but we can't really hold them accountable, you know, for them in the same way we can't hold anyone accountable. And the, the good part of this is that, you know, to the extent that we 
understand that nobody has a free will. All right, we disagree, we, we, we argue, we refute, we have different beliefs, but we don't demonize each other. We don't, you know, make enemies of each other. Um, in this world that we're in now, you know, we're facing the, the important challenges of our time for decades to come now will be the economy and climate change. And I say the economy also because they're, they're intertwined. And if we choose, if we're compelled, because it won't be our doing, to, to continue with this delusion of free will, we're going to be going, we're going to be addressing our future from the context and perspective of blame. We're going to be blaming the 1% for causing this. The 1% is going to be blaming the 99% for being lazy, for just like whatever. We're going to be blaming scientists for not warning us. Um, you know, we can either like address our future, our economic future, and, and the challenges that, uh, that uh, climate change um, has in store for us from this attributive, harmful, divisive, unproductive, you know, energy wasting perspective, or we can like as a world come to understand that no, free will is impossible. We've been fated. We've been fated to not get that that um the climate was changing, you know, because like the effects that we're feeling now um came into being like 30 years ago and you know so like basically whatever we do now that the next 30 years is, is locked into um, existence but just the idea is like it's not our fault but fine it's not our fault so we don't blame each other and that will allow us to work on what needs to be done much more productively much more cooperatively much more effectively um, this doesn't just apply to socio-economic global issues. It applies to our everyday life. We have like a over 50% divorce rate here in the United States. People blame each other. Rather than seeking solutions for why things happen, people say, oh, this person's evil. They're born evil. There's nothing, you know, there's no reason for it. And I'm not saying that like understanding that free will is an illusion is going to be the, the panacea, you know, for everything. But it can certainly help us move from this unproductive, vindictive, irrational, completely delusional mindset that has us focus on the person to a mindset that has us focus on solutions. Okay, thanks for watching.